Good morning, everybody in Korea. It's the evening here in Salt Lake City. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. To dive in, just a quick word about Salt Lake City. You can see here, this is the, the campus nestled right up against the mountains, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, my lab is right here in the bottom right-hand corner. And what's awesome is that in 30 minutes, you can be up mountain biking or skiing. Um, so it's a pretty phenomenal place. If you're passing through Salt Lake, stop by, come say hi. Um, okay, before I dive into the talk, I do need to show two groups of faces, right? So the first group of faces is the people who did this work. You know, I have the pleasure of presenting the work, but really they're the ones who did it. And so um, big props to, to them for making this possible. I'll try and point out individual contributions as I get to them, um, but these people made it happen and these funding agencies sponsored their work. So we're grateful to them. The, the bulk of what you're gonna see today was sponsored through the NSF. Okay, now the second group of faces is more relevant to the talk. It's this one. So this comes from a tweet by Ian Goodfellow. He's a pretty famous uh, person in the machine learning community. Um, and in this tweet, uh, which actually was done in 2018, so I had to add this picture from 2021, but he was pointing out the incredibly accelerated rate of development of generative AI to produce things that look like human faces, uh, which is relevant because he was the person who invented the very first one. This is actually the inventor of the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network, right, which many of us now use regularly. Um, he was a grad student at the time at University of Montreal, I think, which is wild, right? And you can see on the very far left here in 2014, that was the first sort of face that it was sort of capable of producing. And then you see this just wild, you know, it rate, you know, in less than, you know, basically four years, it's turning out things that look really compelling. And nowadays, I should update it in 2023, the faces that it can generate are just remarkably good. And now they, it fixes a lot of the problems, for example, in 2021. One of the things they fixed was texture sticking, where if you make these faces talk or face different directions, the hair would sort of like float even as the, the face moved. And so they fixed that. Sort of, like they're just getting really good at it and really fast. So what we're going to ask is, can we expect to see the same sort of trend happening for materials? And if so, will it happen at the same time scale, right? That's going to be the, the theme of today's talk. Um, but before we do that, you know, I've been doing, I've been speaking about materials informatics for 10 years. Um, and in the early days, I got a lot of guff from people saying like, this can only interpolate. This can't actually extrapolate. In other words, it can't do anything beyond the training data that it's seen before. But boy, we've seen example after example lately that shows that models can be generative. They can do things that looks like they're generating something entirely new. So we've seen lots of examples. Just last year in April, Dolly 2 came out. It feels like a million years since then, because we've since then have you know, Imogen and Midjourney and many others. But this was the one that really, I think, took a lot of people by surprise. You could provide a text prompt and out would come an image that matched it. So here's a, you know, a prompt. This is the title of my kid's favorite children's storybook. So I asked it to give me a picture of the first cat in space, ate pizza. And I think I told it children book style, oil painting or something like that. And out comes this fantastic image, right? So um, we can do more than just images nowadays. So here's one that I did recently, I put together, I like to create a lot of YouTube content for teaching material science. And I was talking about how we can use generative AI to help us basically just transform the way that coding is taught. In the past, you'd have to spend 15 weeks teaching a student how to code, and it was mostly syntax and very little application. Nowadays, you can skip the syntax by using things like ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, other tools out there. And so to make that, I actually was speaking to my computer. So it's using a generative AI to take my voice and turn it into text and then prompt send that into ChatGPT. And then in ChatGPT, in a dialogue fashion, I could tell it, let's plot some data, you know, give me strength versus grain size. And when it gave me nonsense data, I could say, no, it's supposed to be the Hall Petch relationship. And it knew what Hall Petch was. You can see it right here. Uh, if you can see my mouse, sure enough, you see that it's it knows what Hall Petch should look like and it generates that data correctly. You can get it to look exactly how you want. The point is that you can do this with no coding background or minimal, um, which is wild. You can make publication quality figures. And then to make it even cooler, I was able to make a cool YouTube thumbnail where I provide a, um, a bunch of regular pictures of me. And now I say, make a superhero version of me. And sure enough, it Iron Manifies me. And uh, we're able to make this. So I mean, just on and on. And what what can't generative AI do is, is a more appropriate question than what can it do. Um, and I think that's there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. One of the reasons why it's just so dang powerful right now is that we have a lot of great generative models to choose from because in material science, 
we're standing on the corners of giants, as it were, because we have our colleagues in computer science that are really blazing the way for us, coming up with tools like GANs or VAEs or flow-based models and allowing us to simply adapt them to materials challenges. Um, so we're, you're going to see a couple of these ones show up in today's talk today, but um, there's more coming out every day. Every six months, I feel like the previous models are irrelevant because we have something even better, which is an exciting time to be in right now. That said, if you take these types of tools that exist and are making a lot of waves and generating a lot of excitement and you ask it to do material science tasks, it, um, it often falls pretty flat. You know, if you ask it to actually solve like a crack growth equation, it gets the math all wrong in ChatGPT. Um, it can answer a lot of content questions fairly well, but it does some things wrong. And in terms of generating new structures, if that's what you're interested in, generating new materials, um, this is what it gives you, right? If you go to Dolly 2 and you say, give me an oxide crystal structure with offset layers of corner shared ALO6 octahedra with rare earth filled interstitials, most of us who are material scientists know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a crystal structure and you can actually probably picture it uh, as if it was positive investor or something. And yet this is what best or Dolly 2 spits out for me. Um, not exactly what we were looking for. So the question is, are we going to ever be able to solve this problem? And if so, what will it take? So I'm going to show you some of the steps that we've taken in that direction to make generative AI work for the types of problems that we care about in material science. Um, so the first one that I will dive into um, is a very simple scenario. And it's about using what, what's known as style transfer to try and address inverse design. This work came about from Kai Kalwei and Andrew Falkowski. Andrew was recently working at UltraSafe Nuclear Corp, but now he's come back to do a PhD with me, which is amazing because he's a great student. And Kai is at Citrine Informatics where he's doing amazing work for them. Um, if you're not familiar with Citrine, uh, sorry, Citrine style uh, transfer, it came out in 2015. The idea is you take the content of one image the style of another, and you blend the two, right? So here you have the uh, famous picture, Edward Munch's Der Schrei, right? This, this screaming ghost person. And you have this picture of this famous place in Germany. Well, what if you took the style of the, sh of the scream, right? And you mapped it over to that. You get this, that style transfer. So we use this all the time. If you've used any of these toy apps that are out there everywhere nowadays to transform an image into a style of another, it's probably using something like style transfer. Here's one of my beautiful daughter, and she's been transformed into various different versions of, it's basically her, but it's been changed a little bit, right? We've all seen things like this now. What makes this possible is an invention known as the convolutional neural network. Many of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, don't worry. Uh, I'll say that the key thing that the convolutional neural network has going for it is two uh, tools inside of it. One is convolutions and one is pooling operations. Using these two tools um, correctly, we can actually extract the content via pooling and the style via convolutions and, and, the, and the choice of filters. So it allows us to separate those two things out, the style and the uh, content can be separated from one another, which is a pretty important thing. Um, so once you can separate those, then you can say, if we've learned a style, then in comes a new image. And all we're going to try and do is learn the content of that image, learn the style from the other image, and then try and minimize the difference, right? And minimization of that difference leads to style transfer. So we said, what if we did that same kind of approach, but for materials? Of course, you need to be able to predict materials properties you care about. And in its most simple case, in its most simple form, we would represent a material with what's called a composition-based feature vector. So it's exactly what it sounds like. You take the composition, the formula, and we're going to create a vector, a mathematical right string of numbers that represents that formula. Um, so that's the dead simplest way to represent a material. There are much more complicated ways out now. Um, there's composition-based feature vector where you actually encode elemental information. Nowadays, there's much more complex things based off of graphs. Um, so there's other, there's better ways to do it, but this is the simplest. So let's try it first. In this one, I'm going to take my vector and I'm going to give it uh, essentially what's called a one-hot encoding or a fractional encoding, where I'm going to tell it which elements are present by putting their atomic number in, in the sequence. And then I'm going to tell it how much of those there are. So I'm going to separate these out. I'm going to say that the elements present represent the content and their fractional prevalence is the style. And we're going to try and preserve one while changing the other. I'll show you what I mean. So these get passed into a neural network. We're going to use uh, CrabNet because we made it. We think it's a great tool. It uses, it was, it was one of the very first ones that came out that allowed you to use attention, which at the time was a brand new concept. Nowadays, it's pretty commonplace. Um, but it's pretty good at predicting materials properties if you only have the composition. If you have structure, then there are better tools. But if you only have composition, this is a pretty darn good tool. Um, so in comes this representation. It passes through the, the, the architecture of our model, which I'm not going to get into. It doesn't matter. You can treat it as a black box if you want, but out comes a material property. 
Where inverse design comes in is closing the loop and going back to the input saying, okay, you were off by a little bit if you were trying to maximize band gap or minimize it or get it to a certain value, right? You're gonna, you're gonna calculate the, the distance that you were off and now this becomes your loss function. You're gonna try and minimize that by then going back and changing your input. And because it's style transfer, we're gonna try and preserve the elements, but figure out what's the ratio of them that will give us the desired property. And thereby we can achieve inverse design. Now you could do this for a single property like you know band gap, or you could do it for many properties. In fact, you could do multi-objective optimization. And if you want to learn more about this, we've got a great video and you can see you know my video there. Um, if you're interested, you just Google yeah, and you'll learn all about multi-objective optimization. But here's what it looks like. Uh, we were kind of surprised at how okay it was. So on the left, what you're seeing is the loss. That's the thing we're trying to minimize. This is on the figure on the left. On the x-axis, you're seeing uh, the epoch. So basically, as you train it for longer and longer, you want to see that loss go down. And we're seeing that it goes down. It really, at, at one point, it kind of figures it out, and then the, the, the uh, loss drops. That's because in this problem, we were asking it to maximize bulk modulus. And you can see on the right-hand plot of that, it's actually increasing. All of a sudden, it really figures out how to maximize bulk modulus. But what's cool is that every step of the way, you can keep track of what that elemental prevalence was, right? What was the fraction of these different elements? You see that to start, we said that it was one third, one third, one third. We gave it titanium, cadmium, and carbon, all in equimolar amounts, so a third each. And it learned to increase some and decrease others. In fact, to turn some off outright. It even learned the appropriate ratio of titanium to carbon that carbon should be slightly rich, which is reflects the fact that carbides that are carbon rich tend to be harder. Um, and therefore, you know, it's not surprising they have a higher bulk modulus. So pretty cool that it found in this scenario. So we said, let's do something harder. Let's do a multi-objective one. So here we're giving it two tasks. We're going to try and have it maximize bulk modulus, but now minimize something like the decomposition energy. So give it something stable. And so it's a harder task. And this time we also gave it four elements to choose from. So calcium, silicon, aluminum, and oxygen. At first it thinks calcium is important and it's rising. And pretty soon it realizes it actually should turn that off. Um, so pretty cool that it's uh, reaching more realistic compounds here. We then tried to break it. We said, you know, let's give it several different um, components or uh, objectives to try and reach while also giving it 10 different elements. And yeah, it did kind of break it, but I was surprised how semi-reasonable it was. For example, when we gave it 10 different elements. It turned off half of them. It quickly turned off a bunch because again, the training data that this was trained off of was a bunch of DFT calculated materials where 10 elements are not present in that data set. And so it's learned that it shouldn't have that, that it should tend to have uh, smaller mixtures of materials. Um, but, you know, this still has a lot of problems. For one, you know, this doesn't actually guarantee that, it doesn't tell you what the structure is for one thing. And it doesn't even guarantee that you're going to come up with realistic ratios of elements based off of say, even like common um, electron counting rules. So it's a start, but it's a pretty crappy start. Uh, we could do a lot better. So, one thing that you could choose to do um, is instead of using gradient descent, which right now is about 99% of the materials informatics literature, everyone is doing some sort of, some version of gradient descent. There's very few groups actually doing black box optimization, but there's some real advantage. Gradient descent is all about finding out what your objective is and minimizing the distance. So making small changes to minimize that distance between your objective and your current output. The problem, of course, is that this gets stuck in local optima, right? As you're moving down the gradient hill, you'll never go back up, but you might need to to get to your true global minima. Well, black box optimization, there's many different you know, implementations of that, but they do a better job of sampling the overall solution landscape and typically do a better job of finding your true global minima. So let's try one of those out. One example of one would be a genetic algorithm. Genetic algorithms are, have been around for a long time, and we're, we didn't invent anything new here. We just took the non-dominated uh, non sorting genetic algorithm. So it's NDSG, NDSGA2, whatever it is. Uh, it's a pretty common one that's out there. And we just took our representation of the material and adapted it for it. If you're not familiar with genetic algorithms, they're simple in, in concept anyways. They take the same idea that's present in nature that stronger genes will have the chance to pass their genes forward. So you have to have some sort of, there's, there's things that have to be present for a genetic algorithm. You have to have a selection criteria based off of fitness. You have to have crossover and mutation, right? Those elements have to be there. But what's slick is that you don't just take the very best material and slightly change it. You intentionally take some of obviously the very best material, but a bunch of just okay materials as well. And then you're going to combine these genes together. And that's the whole point is that by combining the genes in some interesting ways, you might come up with materials that more, first off, will explore your solution space more broadly, 
but might actually be even better. And so you do this over and over. The problem is that this process is kind of slow because there's selection calculations, there's crossover calculations, there's mutation calculations, each one of these. And you typically do this for a large population of materials, you know, 100 you know, candidates. So these can be slow. That said, um, we gave it a shot. We represented our material with our uh, composition-based feature vector. Um, we came up with a mechanism whereby we could have crossover. It's easy, for example, if both if you're combining two different materials and they both have tantalum in the formula, clearly the offspring is going to have tantalum, uh, barring exceptions for mutations. But what if one parent has oxygen and one has sulfur? Do you make it an oxide or a sulfide, right? So you have a lot of flexibility in how you can tune that. You can make it so that the parent that had a higher fitness value is more likely to retain its chemistry, right? So these are all things that are tunable hyperparameters in your genetic algorithm. And uh, here's another one, right? If you say parent one and parent two are very distinct, you can cause it so that the children are also distinct. For example, I've got four kids and one of them looks like me and three look like my wife, right? Um, or you can imagine a family where the kids, the kids all kind of look kind of like a mix of the two parents, right? There's tunable parameters to set that in your genetic algorithm. We did not really fully explore all the things that genetic algorithms could do. We just tried a sort of uh, basic approach here. We used it not out of the box, but with little tuning. And yet this is what we see. Um, what you see here is a Pareto front plot where you see two parameters. We were trying to minimize thermal conductivity minimize decomposition enthalpy. So give me stable materials that don't conduct heat. And the materials shown in yellow are what are called your non-dominated compositions, sometimes called the Pareto front. These are essentially your best materials that exhibit a trade-off between these two parameters. But when we actually looked at the chemistries of those materials, they were pretty crazy. The genetic algorithm without some sort of guidelines would produce nonsensical structures. So we had to clean it up and throw out things that didn't make sense. And then the stuff that was left over actually looked pretty compelling. And what I think is really cool is when you start comparing this sort of black box optimization to the gradient-based approach, which again was style transfer. It was fixing a chemistry and trying to just get the right ratio. So in teal, the light green here, you see after many, 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 many iterations of our neural network tweaking the formula, we were able to slowly learn how to decrease the thermal conductivity of this material, but it was locked into a chemistry. Right? And so it did a bad job of exploring the solution space, whereas the genetic algorithm in very few data points here was able to explore. Now, the, the, you might be tempted to think that because there's very few data points that that means it was fast. It was not. Genetic algorithms are slow. Neural networks can be fast. Um, here's another one. Here we asked it to maximize mobility, electron mobility, but minimize thermal conductivity. So we're aiming, if we could, for this top left-hand corner. And you see the comparison again in the gradient-based approach it takes many, 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 many calculations, and it's slowly, again, learning how to decrease, decrease thermal conductivity, but it's doing a bad job of learning how to increase mobility, whereas the genetic algorithm is able to explore this design space just much more effectively. Um, so this is a cool approach. I, 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 it was a good start for the, the year that we published. It. I think it was 2018 or something this came out. It was a good start, but if I compared it to sort of the progress that we've seen in sort of making faces, it's certainly more like these, you know, not going to fool anybody faces, than it is like the ones on the right. For example, we didn't know what the crystal structures were. It's still turning out sort of nonsense compositions in many cases based off of some simple rules-based approaches. So eh, it's compelling as a starting point, but it's certainly not done yet. So can we do better? Uh, when COVID hit, I had two students who had an idea about how to address this. So Michael Alverson, who now works on BARD at Google, um, not surprising, and, and Zara Golami started working on this where they tried to actually reproduce the information in the sieve card directly. So if you're not familiar with the sieve card, uh, I'm guessing most people are, but it's a, just a text file. And in that text file, it has things like the space group, uh, the lattice parameters, all the information that structurally you need to reproduce, like these structures that you see up on my wall behind me. If you have the sieve card, then you can reproduce all of them. It's got the atomic positions, all the symmetry operations are all included there. And it's just text. So they basically said like, what if we could just grab that text and learn it with a, genetic, with a generative AI and then start predicting it, which I didn't think would work, but I was kind of curious because for a long time, this has been a real sticking point. In fact, there was no answer to this question. Um, our friends in organic chemistry have been using generative AI to generate molecules for a long time, but they had no tool to generate how those molecules crystallized. It's one thing to generate a single molecule, but it's a much harder one to figure out how that thing will actually crystallize because you have to make sure things don't overlap on one another. Um, you have to have essentially what you need is an invertible representation for a crystalline periodic material. And that didn't exist until last year. Um, I'd love to say that we were the first ones to get it out the door, but we actually uh, got tied 
with some friends of ours in Singapore and MIT, that's Kadar and Tony Wanasisi, who, uh, you know, independently were developing a very similar approach. They call theirs FTCP, we call ours crystal to ping. Nowadays, we call it crystal tensor. But the ideas to both of these approaches is the same. In both of them, you'll see that we encode the information you see in the SIP card, the ABC lattice parameters, the alpha, beta, gamma angles, the space group, the basis, that information gets encoded there. They actually added some things in theirs. They included a reciprocal space feature set, um, which was a cool idea, although I'm not really sure it's useful because I've tried removing it and it doesn't seem to really degrade the properties, but it was a cool idea. Um, ours does something similar, but it also adds a direction graph. And I'll show you what I mean. But to sort of not bury the lead, the point is that now using this approach, we have an invertible representation that is able to generate new crystal structures. And the ones that they're generating are getting very, very compelling. Um, it did not start that way, though. <clears throat> Back in the early days, what we were doing with this is we were, well, first off, we had to pick some sort of generative model. So in the early days, we were using generative adversarial networks because they were outperforming things like variational autoencoders and the others available um, in terms of generating realistic looking faces. So we said, let's try those. If you're not familiar with these, you essentially have a neural network that's a generator. It's going to try and generate new structures. You have a discriminator that takes in real structures and the ones that your generator, the fake ones, and its job is to figure out the real from the fake. That sounds very simple the way I've explained it, um, but you just tie these two things neatly together with backpropagation. So they have the same loss function that in fact, in practice, it's super duper hard. Um, and that's because the discriminator's job is so much easier than the generators. The discriminator sees something real and something fake, and it can very easily tell the real from the fake. So it's a much more powerful neural network. It's, it's more effective at its job. The generator has a supremely hard job to make realistic crystals. So there's ways that you can try and fix this. For one thing, you can handicap the discriminator, give it fewer layers, fewer nodes, make it a, a shallower, simpler network, whereas the generator could be a big, beefy one. Um, but something we found that actually improved it was simply adding this step here in the middle. If you just added a distance uh, from convex hole step to actually throw out the nonsense structures that get generated, then you really make it so that the stuff that arrives at the discriminator is just much better. And so this makes it harder for the discriminator to do its job, which is what we needed. Um, now, if anybody who's done DFT, you're like, well, doing distance from convex holes is a pain in the butt. We just did an ML proxy, uh, which is not perfect, but it's wicked fast, right? And it's good enough. So this allowed us to toss out just the extreme outliers that we thought would not be any good. Um, and the information that you need to grab out of the sieve card, here's an example of what a sieve card looks like on the left, is really simple. ABC, alpha, beta, gamma, space group numbers, all you need for all the symmetries encoded in a single number. That's actually a bad thing. Uh, that makes these things brittle, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, and then the basis. And the basis can be one atom, or it could be 252, or anywhere in between, right? Some, some structures take a lot of unique atoms to define the structure, and some, a single atom will do it. So we needed a, a representation that was flexible to the different number of basis atoms that we were going to come across. Um, good news is that grabbing this data from SIF cards is easy due to the wonderful people like, you know, that created Pymat Gen. so props to them and the Materials Project folks. And there's really good databases, so props to the crystallography community for coming up with the SIV file, which led to the formation of databases like ICSD, ICDD, in our case, we used the PCD, where we had 300,000 sieves, about half of which had the full complement of information that we needed to train from. So that's enough. That's going to be enough for us to train from. So now we needed a, a representation of that information, and it needed to be invertible. So technically, you could have gotten away with a single row of this matrix that you see here. I and mean, look what's present. You've got ABC, alpha, beta, gamma. You've got the space group. And then you just have to have enough columns for each unique atom of the basis. So you'd go from zero, well, from one all the way up to however many you want to include. I think we stopped at 52. We didn't consider any structure with more than 52 atoms just because it was getting too big. So technically, that could have been a vector. We represented it as a matrix just for stability. Remember, we were using a generative adversarial network. These things tend to be diverging a lot. They just they blow up while you're trying to train it. Like they, they start... They just lose it. The backpropagation makes it sound easy, like you're going to slowly change things. But when there's two things pitted against each other, they diverge and then you lose all your forward progress. So one way to improve that we found was by taking that same information and representing it seven times. Now, I think he tried a couple other numbers, but seven just turned out to work the best. And then we would average across those in our final answer. Um, what, now, when we had to use this, he finally got it training and it actually converged. And so he was psyched and he had it generate something. And we go to open this up in Vesta and we get an error, you know, and the error was the fact that, you know, the space group was over 195, so it should have been cubic. And yet 
alpha, beta, gamma maybe weren't equal to 90, ABC maybe weren't equal to one another. Basic symmetry rules that we now know from crystallography have to be adhered to. The model didn't know that those were hard and fast rules. And so if you actually look at the structure, it was usually pretty close to 90-ish and the values were kind of close to each other, but it was, it needed some nudging. And by nudging, we had to introduce rules to enforce some symmetry operations in order to obey symmetry. So we did that. We go to open it again. We get more errors. This time it says, what does it mean for an element to be atomic number you know, 13.441? We're like, oh shoot, yeah, right. This have to be categories. Yes, we use an atomic number to represent them, but they're really categorical. Like you're either oxygen or you're nitrogen. You're not somewhere in between. So you could say, we'll just round it to the nearest number. Well, the problem with that is that if you do that, let's say that this is, it, it, it thought there was 20 atoms in the basis. It, it might give you 20 different elements. And we know from, you know, clear back to Pauling's fifth rule of parsimony, when he said that things tend to be simple structures, that you're not going to find 20 different elements in a compound. So how do you fix that? Well, you can do k-means clustering. You can say, all right, if there's 20 compounds, force it into two groups or three groups or four groups with k-means clustering. And so we did that. That allows us to simplify the structures towards something that should be more parsimonious. Um, that said, all of this work, we finally get one to work. It runs through, we can open it in Vesta. And it was this one on the bottom left. And I love to show it because at the time I was just like, so disappointed because my students had spent like a lot of time on this already. And it was such like, I don't know. I had this naive thought like, man, maybe we're going to like fool some of my chemist buddies. We'll generate a new crystal. They'll think it's a real one, but it was actually made by our fake. This isn't fooling anybody. Like this is a disaster. So I, he want, you know, I was telling him just to hang it up. It was a good try guys, but let's move on to something else. And he was begging like, Hey, let me keep trying this a little bit more. And I was like, all right, give it a shot a little bit more. So he tries a bunch of different architectures, a bunch of different things. And it starts getting, you know, on the bottom right ish. I mean, it's better than the one on the left. We'll, we'll agree to that, but it's still really bad. So one of the reasons why it was so bad, <clears throat> yeah, by the way, putting it in terms of like this sort of face, I'd say that this is like the furthest left that we can get, like really not going to convince anybody. So one of the problems that we had is that this, in the early days here, the generative adversarial network, the discriminator, right, that decides real versus fake, they most of them were using a sigmoid function. Sigmoid function looks like this. It's that a mathematical equation that you see there, and it looks like this in terms of a plot. Why do they, computer scientists love this so much? They love sigmoids because when a value comes in from the neural network and gets flattened down to a single node, and you want to make your prediction based off the value of a single node, this is a good tool for splitting it in either one or zero. There's very, basically, if it's a really negative number, it gets sent to be zero. If it's a really positive number, it's called one. So it's real versus fake. And there's only this small region in the middle where there's ambiguity, which they like because they don't want ambiguity. They want it to make a clear distinction. The problem is that the better and better you get since we're using backpropagation, meaning how far off were we in our correctness, we're using the gradient of this, you end up with what's called the diminishing gradient zone or the or the vanishing gradient problem. Um, so that's a problem. It means that the it, it sort of be like the example I was given is like if you're running a marathon and you, as you got closer and closer to mile 26 or whatever it is, you had to start moving slower and slower. That's essentially what's happening. We're getting less useful information for the next iteration even as we can start to look better and better. Well, the good news is that there's other activation or other you know, activation functions that we can use to make this differentiation. In fact, you don't even have to decide it from a single value. It's one thing that we learned is that you can compare the entire representation that represents your material with things like the earth movement distance or the Wasserstein algorithm, right? <clears throat> and there's others. And one of the benefits of these is that they give you a value that is linear. So that no matter what the generator spits out, you're going to get actionable information for your next round. Um, and using this in 2021, I went to the fall MRS and I showed a bunch of my buddies at the MRS meeting in my talk, <clears throat> the following, I showed them eight structures and I asked them to guess which four were real and which four were fake. And if you look at this for long enough, you'll see them, you'll find the fake ones. And especially if I told you the chemistries or basic things like bonding, you know, if I, if we sent any of these things through check sieve, they would all fail. So, but it was, a, it was certainly a big step in the right direction. We're starting to look more convincing. So what's, what's wrong? What do we need to fix? The big thing that was still wrong here is that the atoms, if you just looked at the basis, they started to look okay. But as soon as you took the symmetry operations, which was represented by a single number, it started putting things on top of each other, right? Because it was too brittle. There's a single number, which doesn't even technically go in order. Like space group two, 244 doesn't necessarily have really similar symmetry elements as 245, right? It was kind of an arbitrary ranking of how they put those, oh, 245, there's only 230, right? But you know what I mean? Um, it, they're, not, they're not ordered in a organized way necessarily. 
Um, yes, they're grouped by you know crystal system, but the individual symmetry operations can change dramatically one to another. So that's just too brittle of a way of encoding such important information because it ends up putting atoms on top of each other. So if you're going to fix this, the only way that we could think of to fix it is to represent your atoms in a graph. They have to have a chance to learn where they are relative to everything else in, in the structure. So what we did is we took our exact same representation as before, and now we just made two-dimensional. So on the top, you see the, the same representation where all of these columns represent atoms in the basis, and all of these rows on here on the side represent atoms in the basis. And in the direction graph, we're going to give them a chance to learn their distance to every other atom in the basis. Okay. This should allow us to learn common sense bond distances when we reproduce this through our generative model. Um, what's kind of cool, and what my student pointed out is like, hey, we did, you could do this with one layer where it's just a direction, but you could add other layers if you wanted. You could make a layer for electro electronegativity difference or range in a ionic size or whatever else, right? You could encode chemistry in these other layers. And we started to try and explore that. Um, and something he pointed out is like, in fact, if you pick three layers, this is now an image, right? And so he called it crystal to ping, right? Crystal to PNG image, because technically you can take this, all the sieve information and encode it in an image. Why is that awesome? That's awesome because that means that we can take tools like Imogen, Dolly2, like diffusion models, these things that are really good for generative AI for making images, and we can use them with very little changes and just provide images, right, of our crystals and have it start to reproduce things like that. Um, and it works pretty well. Um, so you can check it out, Crystal the Ping. We published this in the Journal of Open Source Science, and now we, we're starting to use this in other stuff. But there were some challenges. Okay, so you say, great, the direction graph is awesome. Atom one is able to learn the position of atom two, three, and four in the X direction, in the Y direction, in the Z direction. It's really great. It generates these direction graph matrices. But when you try and invert this, and from the direction graph, which is the output of the generative model, learn where the atoms are located in terms of their XYZ positions, there's some ambiguity. Uh, here's what I mean. Let's say that the, on the right in these sort of tan colored direction graphs, that's what is the learned value from the generative model. So it spits that out. So here's your material, here's the direction graph. Now you figure out where the atoms go. If you follow the instructions, there's no problem at first. From atom one's perspective, you can figure out where atoms two, three, and four are. The problem happens when you start to consider from atom two, three, and four's perspective, they don't line up exactly, right? Because this isn't like physics rules-based approach. This is, this is, you know, learned. This is probabilistically learned. And so they don't quite line up on the exact spot. So you might just say like, well, maybe they're pretty close. Just average it, <laughs> take the average value. And that's what we did. But before we just threw the information out, we kept track of what was the variance was it really sure that it was in one spot or was there like a lot of uncertainty? We're gonna hang on to that value because I'm gonna postulate that the smaller that variance, the better the model, meaning it's more confident when it makes a prediction, okay? So we're gonna hang on to that value. Um, and you know, ultimately, how good are these models? We need some metrics that describe how good they are. So we're gonna show you a few of these. The first one is that you could compare for all the different sorts of things that it predicts, um, you could compare how confident it was in its prediction. Or in other words, what was the uncertainty when it predicted the lattice parameter? How much uncertainty was there when it predicted the lattice angle or the space group or the positions or the coordinates, right? Um, and what we found is that as you move from GANs, these are the generative adversarial networks, the sort of simplest GAN models that first came out uh, for generative AI. When you compare those with a Wasserstein GAN, which are the ones I showed you that have the different activation function, we see about an order of magnitude improvement and then when you compare those with diffusion models in a paper that's coming out, that's on Chem Archive right now, it's coming out very soon in uh, Digital Discovery, I think, it gets another order of magnitude better. It gets really good at this point. Like if you take like the space group, the space group uncertainty squared is six. I mean, it's pretty darn sure which space group it's talking about, because even when you square it, it's only six. Um, and we'll be following this up with, you know, some other generative AI models to compare how they look. But to me, this is pretty good evidence that diffusion models are quite confident when they make a prediction. But it, what's the output look like? The proof is sort of in the pudding. If you look at vanilla GANs, the sort of simplest generative AI, they're pretty bad. The unicells are massive. The atoms are on top of each other. The chemistries are crazy. Um, not very convincing. Compare that with Wasserstein GANs. Again, this is like what I showed at the Fall Emerson meeting in 2021. They're better, but they're still crazy structures. They, they still have some problems. And then you compare that with the stuff coming out of our diffusion models, and they're producing very highly realistic crystals, um, broad, you know, use of crystals. Uh, you're seeing a breadth of different structure types, um, chemistry types, 
they're looking increasingly realistic. The bond distances are no longer crazy. So pretty interesting. One, one thing that we did is we actually compared the data from the distribution, the distribution of data that we trained on with the distribution of the output data from the generative model. One would assume that if it's learned what the distribution looks like and it can reproduce it, that would be a good thing. So on the left, what you're seeing is the atomic numbers used uh, in our output of our model in gray versus the atomic numbers in the training data set in salmon color. So in the training data set, there's a bunch of oxides, but that's why you see this big spike at what is oxygen at, at number eight or whatever, right? But there's like no noble gases because noble gas compounds don't form. So that's sort of the fact that there's like a bunch of different elements are possible. Some are prevalent and some are not prevalent is lost entirely on, on vanilla GANs. It thinks everything is like a transition metal and a, an actinide, I guess, right? Now you compare that to a Wasserstein GAN and it thinks that everything's available, but it hasn't learned that oxygen is common and you know neon shouldn't be. Now compare that with the diffusion model and check it out. It's really matching the distribution pretty well. It's learning that some things like oxygen are just way more prevalent and others should be turned almost off. You see the same thing when you look at the lattice parameters, or in this case, look, this is space group. The vanilla GAN thinks that everything is space group 140 to 160. The Wasserstein GAN kind of thinks that all 230 are available. And the diffusion model has learned that, yeah, there's 230, but really six or seven dominate. And there's you know a few others that are like middling. So it's learning how to better represent the data. And one last thing that you could look at in comparing it is you could say, what if you took the output crystal structures, right? These are actual SIV cards now, they're actual crystal structures. Well, you could simulate their properties with an ML prediction of a bunch of different materials properties, Poisson's ratio, bulk modulus, band gap, whatever you want. And you could compare those predicted properties with the predicted properties from real crystals. And in these violin plots, you see the dark gray are real crystals and the other ones are from our different models. Again, it looks to me like the diffusion model is sort of best matching the real data, although there is some variation here. Something that we've done in our final paper is we've taken the output crystals and we've done uh, DFT calculations on them to relax the structure and say like, okay, it thinks this is a real material. Let's relax it and see if that's the most stable structure. And you can actually track the distance that the atoms move during that process. And we report that in our paper and find that it's pretty good. So where does this put us in our sort of progress of materials informatics going from terrible to useful? I think with this recent stuff that we've been able to put out, we are now useful. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to start doing something with it. Why do I know that? Because when I presented this most recent work at the Gordon conference last year, uh, I had two groups independently see this structure that I've shown here and text their postdocs back home and say, hey, make this. And they both made it. And actually it was the right space. It, let's see, it was the right crystal system, wrong space, group, wrong basis. But like, it was it was compelling enough that they felt a desire to actually try and make it. We've actually partnered with one of these groups um, at Johns Hopkins to actually take now a much better version of our model. It's turning out even more you know, realistic structures and have them start actually trying to make these things, which is exciting. Um, in fact, something I'm excited about going forward is now pairing this tool that we've created for generative AI with large language models. We have a grant where we're actually going to try and take descriptions of materials, have that be the training data and match that with the CIV card such that you can actually describe it like a chemist would and have it start creating new materials based off of descriptions. So this is pretty exciting because that's how humans work, right? When I want to find a new lithium ion conductor, I think to myself, it's got to have lithium on partially occupied sites. It's got to have channels. It's got to have layers. It's got to have large thermal displacement parameters. That's what I'm thinking about. We should be able to describe materials and pair that with these uh, crystal to ping or crystal tensor descriptions, and then use generative AI in a conditional manner to turn out materials based off of specific descriptions. That's coming soon. It's not out yet. Um, okay, so we're at 1040, uh, my time. So we've got maybe 10 minutes left. Let me ask the question, like, is it good enough to just generate materials or do we really need to turn our attention to make sure that we're generating interesting materials? I ask this because, you know, we use machine learning to generate a bunch of materials that were super hard. And we were way excited about that. But when I would go and tell people about it and show them what the materials were, they'd be like, oh, well, it's a transition metal borocarbide. Of course, it's going to be hard. And I would say, well, you didn't test it, right? So it's still useful, but it's a fair criticism. Yeah, it wasn't very chemically distinct from what you might expect. So is there a way to make a machine learning model, a generative AI that takes into account chemical novelty and interesting? Because that's what we'd love to find. We'd love to find interesting new families of materials. 
Um, we think that we can. In fact, I just finished my sabbatical in the UK, and a big part of that was developing this tool uh, called Discover. Discover stands for Descending from Stochastic Clustering Variance Regression. Um, essentially, what it does is it is a tool that allows you to introduce a new um, parameter into your optimization schema. So instead of just trying to find a material that has whatever multi-objective you have in terms of properties, you know, a certain band gap, a certain strength, whatever it may be, we have a whole new orthogonal axis, which is chemical novelty, which we can introduce. And we, for a long time, were wanting to do this, but what we didn't know was how do you actually determine when something's chemically similar or dissimilar from something? The, the example I give is always something like this. Like if I gave you a bunch of different chemistries and formulas, and I asked you to create a chemical you know, similarity matrix and fill it in, like figure out which ones of these between zero and one, put zero values between zero and one, where one means it's really similar or the same and zero means it's totally different. How would you fill this out? Um, there's no consensus that I came across on how to do that. Um, fortunately, about the same time, our friends at the University of Liverpool had just published something known as the uh, element movers distance. It uses the earth movers distance algorithm, which we talked about earlier, which compares distributions, but it does so based off of composition uh, based feature vector information. And so using this, you actually get a value that tells you how similar two formulas are. That's what we needed for our approach. So once we had that, you know, we could take this earth movers distance approach applied to chemistry. And we, once you have a similarity metric, you can do things like dense map embeddings. So if you're familiar with embed embeddings like TSNE plots or UMAP plots, or even PCA plots, technically are kind of a type of embedding, none of those things take into account density of compounds. You might see them in the plot. You might see like, oh, there's a whole bunch of data points in this cluster and not very many over here. But with dense map embeddings, you can actually quantify that density gradient. That's important because once you quantify the density and gradient, uh, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, for example, you can identify which clusters are, or, or, or organized there based off of cluster analysis, but you can also actually quantify how far away you are from known clusters. And this gives us the metric that we care about because now you have a new Pareto front, right? Take a look at this plot here. Let's say the y-axis is like your, your property that you care about, right? So maybe you want to maximize whatever that property is. But now on the x-axis, you have a whole new metric, which is your chemical uniqueness, which is pretty cool. And this gives you the opp opportunity as a scientist to decide where do you want to spend your time? Are you in a field where you don't care about finding something that's chemically unique so long as it has the right properties? Great. Then you can explore things that have a, don't have to have a high novelty score as long as they have the properties you care about. But if you're more on the physics end of things and you just want to find interesting new materials you can, you can do that. You don't necessarily care that they're the best in their class yet. You know you're going to follow it up with additional you know, validation, but you want them that are way out there, well, you can find those too. Um, we're working now on a, a second version of this that takes into account structural similarity. So we're calling this Discover 2.0, um, and that should be coming out soon. But to test whether this worked or not, we tried it out. We took a, di a distribution of data. In this case, we took bulk modulus data. And if you're familiar with bulk modulus data, and it goes in, it goes from anywhere between zero and technically up to around 400 or so. Um, but the vast majority, like 98% of them, will be 300 gigapascals and less. So what we did is we took the top 2% of these performers and we hid them. So we're going to ask, can our model find those 2%, those top 2% of our materials, while also being able to find interesting new chemistries? So here's what we're testing for. First off, how many of the top 2% can it find? How many unique atoms can it add based off of what it's trained on before? And then how many new interesting formula types like AX versus AX2, for example, how many new formula templates? And there's others we came up with. You can read our paper in Digital Discovery if you want to check it out. But here's three that I'm going to show you today. Um, and when we compare it, we can test it with four different approaches. First would be a random search. Like if you just picked formulas from a list of these total number of formulas, pick them randomly out of hat, that would be our random search. Then you can take our discover algorithm, but you can tune it different ways. You can tune it so you care more about novelty, more about performance, or 50-50. And I'm going to show you the performance of these different ones. So what you see in this top row here, forgive me, there's a lot going on here. In the top row, it's showing you what fraction of those extraordinary, you know, top 2% materials was able to find. In the left, we see random search. So after 900 cycles of adding new compounds randomly, it found about maybe 20 of them, 10 of them. So not efficient. Meanwhile, on the far right, we see the discover algorithm with performance bias. It found all of them. Within 900 cycles, it found them all. 
And then you see the other ones on this, the second column shows you discover score with novelty in mind. Again, when you prioritize novelty, it's not necessarily going to find your best performing materials because that's not its job. And then the 50-50 shows a really good performance um, of finding high performers. But if you look at the other categories like unique atoms and unique templates, it also does a pretty good job of finding those. So it's a great way to have the trade-off, sort of the best of both worlds of exploitation and exploration, right, if you will. And that's the benefit of having a tool like Discovery is that it gives you the ability to find out where, you know, depending on what your research interests are, you can dictate how you want to use the algorithm. And you can technically use it to find chemically really interesting new materials. So you can check it out here. Everything we publish on GitHub and openly available, we try and be really responsive and, you know, good citizens in this space, generating uh, data that can be built on, that's modular, that's helpful, that's unit tested really well. We introduced uh, new classes like the Discover and the Adapt classes, which we are using in other tools already and others are starting to use. We think they're useful. So you can check those out. Um, and I would just end my talk here. I'll say, you know, I want to save some time for questions, but I'll point out that if any of this was interesting, but you're like, I'm not an informatics or a data science person, I would say, great, right? There's more resources now than ever before. 10 years ago, when I started doing this, nobody was doing it. It was a brand new area. And so we had to basically go over to our CS, you know, compadres and just beg them to show us how to do some of this stuff. And nowadays there's great resources and I've actually put some of them together for you. I have a really cool uh, YouTube playlist for materials informatics. Um, it says 51 videos there, but I think I've added another, I think we're closer to 60 now. Um, this has become a really powerful uh, community based tool to teach people about informatics. I'm teaching the class again in the spring. So expect another 50 videos to show up in the spring as I go into more detail, especially as the stuff gets outdated in six months, it's already sort of outdated. We need new stuff coming up. So that's a great resource. And I also have a podcast, uh, which is, we call it materialism. And it is the podcast that I wanted to listen to that didn't exist, right? There weren't good material science podcasts. And so we picked one, uh, a format that we thought people would resonate with. And five years later, it's a hit. Um, it is a regularly in the top five of the chemistry uh, rankings on iTunes, which is pretty rad because we're not even chemists. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in learning about the, the interesting backstory behind known materials, up and coming materials, um, scandalous materials, we try and cover all of that in that podcast. So with that, um, I will be happy to take any questions and I appreciate uh, people coming in today.